السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من اللسان يفقه قولي قال الله تعالى في الفرقان الحميد يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وآله My noble audience, brothers and sisters, elders, children uh, We only have two more programs included tonight uh, So I believe it is most proper that we dedicate tonight and the following program to the month of Ramadan. If we study the entire Quran from cover to cover, there's only one section in the entire Quran that has been dedicated to the month of Ramadan. So there are many, many sections in the Quran, 540 more or less, and that's why the scholars that have an inclination that the 27th of Ramadan is Laylatul Qadr, one of the deleves, evidence, is that if you recite one section in every raka'ah of Tarabi, over 20 raka'ats every day, you will finish the Qur'an on the 27th. So there are 540 sections. If you recite one section in each raka'ah, and there are 20 raka'at of Tarabi, you will complete on the 27th. So this is one of the deleves of those people that have a strong inclination that the 27th of Ramadan is Laylatul Qadr. Now, there is one section from 540 that has been dedicated to the month of Ramadan. But before we speak about the fine details pertaining to this section, I would like to uh, draw the attention of my noble audience to the goal of fasting, the maqsad. And then we are going to study the preceding verses and the final verse of this section to understand the relationship of fasting with the goal. So let's study. If I would like my noble brothers to just focus upon this word, tattakun. Now Allah Almighty says that you are fasting for one reason, so you can attain piety. Now, if I was to ask myself or ask my noble audience that, all right, I can understand that piety means righteousness and piety. How do I know if I have it or not? How do I know if I have righteousness and piety? For example, one person says, I'm very, very fit. So the person, the personal trainer says, I will tell you if you are fit or not. Come tomorrow to the gym and let's see if you can do the workout. So he takes him into the gym and he makes him go through a workout. <coughs> After the workout, the personal trainer will say, yes, indeed, you have passed. You are very, very fit. So the arena where he will be tested for his level of fitness is determined by the personal trainer. Does that make sense? Now when we talk about piety and righteousness, and I spoke about this topic in Holland Park Mosque as well, that when we want to <coughs> determine that if I have piety or not in the month of Ramadan, after exiting the month of Ramadan, where do I go? Where do I check it? So the scholars have said there is a subtle hint in the preceding verses and in the concluding verse of this section. And that subtle hint is where we have to go to determine if I have piety or not. Now I would like my noble brothers that have just left I think. If we uh, scroll two, three verses back. And I'm going to recite that verse to you. So this is verse 183. This is from where the section starts. Doesn't matter, 183. We're going two or three verses back. And that is verse 180. Alright, 180. Allah Almighty says, brother is coming, Kutiba alaykum, 
إذا حضر أحدكم الموت إن ترك خيرا للوصية للوالدين والأقربين بالمعروف حقا على المتقين. So we're going to go a few verses back. That's one verse, two, and one more. One more. Yeah, a little bit more, little bit more. This is a verse. One little bit more. That's it. Kutiba. Now, the translation of this verse more or less is, it is prescribed for you when death approaches any of you, if he leaves wealth, that he makes a bequest to parents and next of kin according to reasonable manners. This is a duty upon al-muttaqun, the righteous. So the message of this verse is that when a person is passing away he should have a will and in that will he has to stipulate who is receiving from his estate make sense all right this is the preceding message to the section of fasting it is pertaining to the distribution of our wealth distribution of our wealth now let's go down to verse 188 that is the concluding verse to this section and that is this verse no, no. there it is this is the final verse of this section Allah Almighty says وَتُدْلُوا بِهَا إِلَى الْحُكَّامِ لِتَأْكُلُوا فَرِيقًا مِنْ أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ بِالْإِثْمُ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Now the translation more or less is and eat up not one another's property unjustly nor give bribery to the rulers that you may knowingly eat up a part of the property of others sinfully Now basically this is highlighting the mannerism by which we collect our wealth that do not collect your wealth by deception by paying out the rulers by bribing somebody so the final verse is highlighting the way we make the wealth and the preceding message to this section speaks about the distribution of wealth does it make sense now, let me take you on a journey. Brother was saying that we didn't go on the journey last week to Mi'arad. Inshallah next year, if we are still alive. But as I came to know that Mi'raj takes so many, many weeks, so we'll start four weeks prior to the actual day of uh, ascension. On the day of judgment, you and me will find ourselves at different junctions. One of the most popular junctions where you and me will stand and we will not be allowed to take the next step is the junction where we will be posed five questions true and out of the five questions two of them are pertaining to wealth first question is how did you make your wealth and second is how did you utilize your wealth Basically, how did you make it and where did you distribute it? Does it make sense? Now we come back to the section under discussion. Previous verse speaks about how you are going to utilize your wealth, distribution of your wealth. Concluding verse of this section speaks about, speaks about how you make your wealth. So the subtle hint is, after the month of Ramadan, if you want to know if you have adorned yourself with taqwa, look at your mu'amalat. If you want to know if you have attained a higher level of piety, do not analyze your prayers. That is not the first avenue. The first avenue where you will determine if you have attained taqwa by exiting the month of Ramadan is are you still cheating in your mu'amalat? Are you dodging the system? Are you lying? And that's why there are many, many Muslims throughout the world that pray but they still cheat. 
What does the Quran say? Udkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter into Islam perfectly, in totality, completely. And I may mention a few weeks ago, completely means attaining perfection in aqaid, attaining perfection in ibadat, attaining perfection in akhlaq, attaining perfection in mu'amalat, attaining perfection in mu'asharat, and then attaining perfection in Islami riyasat. These are all different departments of Islam. And to be weak in any department that I have made mention will leave a person a weak believer. He has not fulfilled the command of the Quran that he has not entered Islam perfectly. Akhlaq, mu'amalat. So akhlaq means your ethics, mannerism, mu'amalat, your dealings, mu'asharat, the mode of life. Ibadat, the rituals, aqaid, the tenets of faith, Islami riyasat, the laws pertaining to governance. So all the fine details pertaining to these different departments and facets of Islam have to be known and then a person has to implement them to fulfill the command, udkhulu fi silmi kafa. So ibadat has many different rituals. And one ritual is soul, fasting. But how do we know that if we have attained the goal of fasting, that is taqwa, we will find ourselves in a dealing. And we will check that is my dealing in conformity with the dealing that Allah has allowed. If it is not in conformity with the dealing that Allah has allowed, then I have exited the month of Ramadan, but I have not attained taqwa. That's why the proceeding and the concluding verse has to be understood to understand where we are going to test our taqwa. Very, very important. So we find that people increase their ibadat. But they do not give the same consideration to their mu'amalat. So many people send me messages. So many people send me messages. And to send me that kind of message is stupidity in itself. Because most probably my phone is tapped. And they send me a message that do I have to give taxes? Send me a message. Is it okay, okay to dodge the system? And the simple reply is, you tell me. You tell me, do you feel satisfied? That if you dodge the system, do you feel satisfied that it is okay? Because at the end of the day, every person has a hidden mufti. Right in the heart. When a person does good, that mufti they says, shabash, well done. And when a person is doing bad or intends to do bad, that mufti, that mufti says, oh, it's wrong what you are doing. But now they want to. That, that mufti has told them it is wrong. But then they come to the mufti of this dunya. Mufti Uzan, mufti that, mufti that. And they try to challenge the mufti of the inside. By trying to get a ruling that will support their lust and desire to negate their own mufti that is inside. So don't come up with these stupid rulings and don't try to manipulate the uh, imma the imams and don't put them in that position most of the things that you ask you know if it is right and wrong don't try to get a ruling that can support your lust and desire not the truth all right now we will study the verse um, by which Allah Almighty starts this section that has been dedicated to the month of Ramadan and most probably this will be the only verse that we will study tonight. So first of all Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. And we will pause at Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Allah Almighty says, O believers. Now basically if we study the Quran, there are two types of address in the entire Quran. One is Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. <coughs> And the second kind of address is Ya Ayyuhannas. 
If we study the third section of Surah Baqarah, Allah Almighty says, Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budu rabbakum. O people, worship your Lord. Worshipping Allah is a duty upon every single human being. It is upon every single human being. That's why Allah addressed every single human being. No one has been excluded from that address. And ibadat is established when a person attains the ma'rifah of Allah Almighty. But the second kind of address that is a very unique style of the Quran is the address of Amanu. Ya ayyuhalladina Amanu. Where Allah addresses a selected group of humanity. And let's be particular about it. That if there are 7 billion people in the world, this address is only for 1.7 billion. 5 billion people have been excluded by the Creator Himself. It is just like there's a group of people sitting in front of me. And I say, brother and brother Salim, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to these people. Now, if I'm addressing two people by name, and in that gathering there are ten people, and I say, you are very, very good. Yeah? You are going to be rewarded. Now, of course, this will increase their courage. It will allow them to flourish and blossom. It will make them overexcited. But think about the eight people that have been left out. It demoralizes them. Likewise, when Allah addresses us in the Quran by the noble address, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, immediately, We should be so attentive that out of so many people, Allah is addressing me. Five billion people in modern time have been excluded from this address. There's only 1.7 billion that have been addressed by the Creator. And that in itself is a station of nobility. So Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladina adam. The connection that we have with Allah that makes us distinct from humanity is the connection of Iman. And Allah has used that to be the mode of address. Ya ayyuhal ladina adam. O people of belief. Then Allah Almighty says, Kutiba alaykum as now, I want my noble brothers to focus upon this word Siyam. Now, Siyam is the plural of soul. Siyam is the plural of soul. Soul means fasting. Now, in English, we call it fasting. I think in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, we call it a Roza. In Arabic, we call it soul. Now, literally, soul means to abstain. <coughs> to abstain. But according to Islamic law, there is a much deeper, wider definition to soul. Literally, soul means rukajana, to stop, to abstain. But Islamic law says no. Soul has a much greater definition. So the people that have worked upon Islamic law, the Muslim jurists, the clerics of the past, the theologians, they have given a very comprehensive yet concise definition. And the comprehensive yet concise definition is soul is to abstain from food, from liquid, from marital intimacy, from dusk to sunset, with the intention of fasting. That is what soul is, according to Islamic law. I'll say that once again, because we're going to shed light upon the definition with a few examples. So soul, according to Islamic law, is to abstain from food, to abstain from liquid, to abstain from marital intimacy, from the crack of dawn to sunset, with the intention of fasting. If any condition that has been stipulated has not been met, soul will not be accepted so for example nowadays we have very precise times this is a precise time you look at the time on your mobile it is precise that may not be precise it may have a weak battery so it may not be precise 
but the mobile time is very very precise and we live our life according to the time we do not go out searching for sunset we do not go out searching for sunrise we do not differentiate between Subai Sadiq and Subai Kadhib. We accept the time. Many people ring me in the month of Ramadan, once again trying to get a ruling. For example, if the starting time of fasting was at 5 a.m. and finishing time was 5 p.m., they would say, Imam Sahib, can you give us a ruling? Yes, what is the question? that I kept eating and when I looked at the time it was one past five so it's only one minute into the fasting is my fast accepted or is it null or void or that I opened my fast and it was 4.59 only one minute before is it null and void what is the definition according to Islamic law from the crack of dawn to sun set if this condition is not met by one minute by 30 seconds by 10 seconds by one second by a split second fasting will not be considered accepted so that's why i have had a lengthy discussion with my noble colleague and i would say like my father figure imam yusuf birsa that uh, in the past you will see in the Islamic calendar they have uh, imsak you see it on the, in the calendar the Ramzan calendar so let's say uh, Fajr time is at 5 o'clock and they have imsak at 4.55 imsak means stop now people they will stop at 4.55 and this caused a lot of confusion in the Muslim community that what is the status of that five minutes before the starting time of Fajr. Now, mashallah, you people are mostly religious. I can say intensely religious. So you will know, but a lot of people outside do not know. So they will stop at 4.55 and they may start praying after 4.55 in the time of Suhoor. So I had a lengthy discussion and Alhamdulillah I have won them over and we have removed that section, that column of Imsaq. So there's going to be no Imsaq. Our Imsaq stopping is the starting time of Fajr and that is 5 o'clock. Now it is a duty upon the community to stop. By 5 they should stop. They should not exceed that 5 by 1 minute or 2 minutes. So the best approach to this is we start wrapping up a bit earlier than five so we are on the safe side rather than on the borderline do not challenge the borderline a little bit before if you stop alhamdulillah it will be fine All right. the second uh, Thing that uh, the Quran, the, the Islamic law makes mention of is with the intention. It is very important. Now, a lot of people they get confused with the intention. Now, let me make it very clear intention is the function of the tongue or the heart. It's the, it's the function of the heart. Remember that. Now, many a times, and I'm not saying they're doing right or wrong, I'm not getting into that. I'm not a person that gives fatwas and rulings that he's right or he's wrong. But many a time you see a person. He's standing behind the Imam. Now the Imam says, Allahu Akbar. And he has said, Alhamdulillah. And he's still making intention. His intention, Allah. I'm standing in Slacks Creek Masjid. Behind Imam Akram. Facing towards the Qibla. In the state of purity. By that time he has finished half his Qirat. He has missed his takbir al tahrima Now, takbir al tahrima is to join with the Imam before he starts Surah Fatiha. Remember that. You know, getting the takbir al tahrima they say if you pray behind the Imam for 40 days without missing the takbir al tahrima you will be granted emancipation from the fire of Jahannam. You will be granted freedom from nifaq. This takbir al tahrima means from the time the Imam says Allahu Akbar before Surah Fatiha. 
If one person is standing there making such a lengthy intention that he misses the takbira, tahrima, that means that there is a fault. There is a blemish in this intention. Now the scholars have accommodated everyone. Now many people, they have, a, they have a strong hold on their mind and on their thoughts. So when they make an intention with their heart that I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, and they start praying, they conclude their prayer, they start fasting, they conclude their fasting, there is no second thought that comes to their mind. Because they are very strong in their mind, they have control over their thoughts. There's no second thought that comes in their mind, there's no confusion. The shaitan cannot inject any level of scruple, doubt. But there are some people, if they do not hear it themselves, they are not satisfied. For example, if they make the intention in their heart that I am fasting, down the track, whilst they're fasting, there may be a doubt that comes in their mind, did I make intention or not? So now the scholars accommodate. So a lot of people say it is bidah to make intention verbally. They are not accommodating the masses. A faqih, a Muslim jurist, I made mention last week of a principle. I'm giving you another principle now. A Muslim jurist, that is a true jurist, that is adorned with hikmah and wisdom, he will come up with a ruling to accommodate everyone. Not manipulating Islam, but extracting a law from Islam that can accommodate everyone. Al-Mu'minun hayyinun layyinun. More or less, the Nabi of Allah says, Al-Mu'min is very soft and lenient. So if there is one person who has no control over his thoughts and the intention of the heart does not satisfy him, it does not allow him to settle down, then for him, verbal statement expression of the intention is highly recommended so he can with satisfaction discharge the obligation <coughs> but for a normal person going to sleep at night is an intention in itself waking up early in the morning is, is an intention in itself coming to the mosque driving to the mosque to slex creek is an intention that you're going to establish isha so you don't have to make this verbal statement but let's say one person, he had a very, very long day and he was absolutely exhausted and he sleeps at one o'clock in the morning and he wakes up the following day at three o'clock. He's missed his fajr, he wakes up at three o'clock, he prays his zohar and suddenly something happens at home, he takes his child to the hospital, he's unaware of what is happening and the time of maghrib enters. He has not taken a sip of water a morsel of food, he made no intention of fasting, the fasting will not be accepted. This is the meaning. That is the meaning of intention. Does it make sense? All right. Now, <coughs> Allah Almighty says, Kutiba alaykum as is prescribed for you the fasting. Now, Kutiba is used in the sense of Furiza. Furiza means incumbent. Now, kutiba means writing. It has been written down for you. But it has been used in the sense furiva, faras. It has been made incumbent upon you to fast. Now, the next fragment of the ayat is very amazing. And I would like to share this with you right now. Allah Almighty says, it is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for people before you so you can become righteous now the purpose of verse 183 is to inform you and me that we have to fast so I'm going to read the ayat by removing a fragment Listen, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam la'allakum tattakoon O you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you so you can become righteous. The message has been delivered. The message has been delivered. 
that oh you who believe fast it has become compulsory for you so you can become pious why did Allah add the word كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ as it was prescribed for people before you we believe that every letter in the Quran every word in the Quran has a reason the Quran is a fountain of knowledge wisdom there is no word that has not a maqsad in the Quran. So the scholars say that this fragment of the ayat has a very deep meaning. The first wisdom behind it is, let's say that this group is right here, and I say I'm going to finish my program at 8 o'clock, and after 8 o'clock, Dr. Saad, you, you will remain and clean the entire masjid. Dr. Saad says, what about the other people? I said, they go home. What? Me? I have to clean all this. Why? Why are they going to stay back? You know, why are they going to leave and I have to stay back? He will feel very demoralized. He will be hurt that he is the only one selected to do something that he doesn't want to do. So Allah Almighty in a very beautiful style, He says that, look, this, this fasting is going to be inconvenient for you. It's going to demand you to change your lifestyle. You're going to sleep at odd hours. You're going to wake up at odd hours. You're going to sleep, eat, drink, behave in a very different style. You're going to change your lifestyle for 29 or 30 days. Now, if this was a injunction that was prescribed for us alone we will say why only us why not the people in the past so allah almighty says you're not the only one that has received this injunction people in the past have received this injunction as well now this gives us comfort all right imam Muzair said dr Sam, and all of you have to stay back and clean this gives everyone comfort by looking at the person beside him does it make sense now, of course, the fasting of the past was not completely identical to the fast that we fast. There is a possibility the hours may differ, the fine details to that fasting may differ. For example, zakat, zakat. For the Jewish people, for us, as we know, it's two and a half percent. True. So if we have a hundred dollars, I don't know if I should speak about zakat tonight, but no, I'm not going to speak about it. We will not cover nothing then. But if I had a hundred dollars, let's just say, and I was a rich person, I will give two dollars fifty cents in the path of Allah. That's known as zakat. Jewish people have to give twenty-five percent. Out of one hundred dollars, they have to give twenty-five dollars. So they gave zakat, we give zakat, but the fine details differ. When a person experiences a wet dream or he is intimate with his wife, he is known as Jumbi, Janaba, Hadasi Akbar, impurity that is not visible but is of the greater kind. So the only way he can remove this impurity is by taking a bath. How many times do we take a bath? Once. If a Jewish person became Junbi, he had to take a bath seven times. Seven times. Look at the facilities we have now. Look at the facilities they had in those days. They had to draw water from the well. They had a bucket of water. For them to have a bath seven times to remove Janaba, was much more taxing than us taking a bath nowadays seven times. So most probably they may think twice, three times, four times before becoming intimate. Oh, especially in winter, seven times. Sure they are. I'll stock up for summer. Stock up for summer. If our clothes become impure, we wash the clothes, true, we wash the clothes. For Bani Israel, they have to cut it. It can never become pure. Yeah? Impurity, laws, they differ. 
So we just wash it two, three times. When we feel that it is clean, it is alhamdulillah pure, we can pray in it. But they could not wash it, they had to cut it. Then patch it up. So that's why Nabi Akrim Muhammad says that this deen is the deen of moderation. You pray, don't miss your prayer. But if you are sick, sit down and pray. If you can't sit down, lie down and pray. If you don't have water, make the yammu. This concession of dry ablution has only been granted to the ummah of Nabi Akrim Muhammad So Allah Almighty says that they used to fast as well. Now this gives us psychological comfort. Doesn't it? It gives us psychological comfort. Not only us, but everyone used to fast. But let me draw your attention to something. We will always be better off. Always be better off. Nabi Akrim Muhammad says, and I'm, I'm putting this in my own words, so it makes much more sense. Let's say there's a carpenter. And he's hired to make this table. So he works from Fajr to Zohar. A carpenter. He works from Fajr to Zohar. So Dr. Saab says, Imam Saab, you're a carpenter. Can you make this table? I said, why not Dr. Saab? So Dr. Saab says, alright, you work from Fajr to Zohar. So I work from Fajr to Zohar. I work and I work. How many hours? Six hours. I work for six hours. After six hours, Dr. Saab says, Alhamdulillah, you've done a beautiful job. I'm giving you $50. He gives me $50. I walk away. Then another person comes. Dr. Saab says to another person, you come. That person has left. Can you make this table another table? So he said, all right. So he works from Zohar to Asr. Half the time of Fajr to Zohar, that is three hours. He does exactly the same work. And I say, all right, I'm going to give you $100. He takes $100. Then another person comes at the time of Asr. He's a carpenter as well, same qualification. And uh, Dr. Saab says, all right, can you work for me until Maghrib? Half the time between Zohar and Asr, only one and a half hours. First person, six hours, $50. Second person, three hours, $100. Third person, one and a half hours, and he gets $200. And Nabi Akrim Muhammad after giving this example, he says that person that has to work from Fajr to Zohar is a Jewish person. Maximum effort, minimum reward. Maximum effort, minimum reward. And that's why they got the wealth of this dunya. Remember, scholars have made mention, that's why they control the economy of the world. Because for Allah, this world and whatever it contains is not greater than the wing of a mosquito. Allah has given that wing to them. Even in the time of Nabi Akrim Muhammad Sallallahu they were controlling the economy. Banu Kanuka, Banu Nadir, Banu Qurayza. From the inception of Islam till the departure of Nabi Akrim Muhammad Sallallahu they were urdent and staunch enemies. They always had wealth. This is their reward at $50. $50. Now that person that works from Zohar to Asr is from the Nasara. Moderate effort, moderate reward. And that person that works from Asr to Maghrib is us. Minimum effort, maximum reward. Minimum effort, maximum reward. And that's why I say it will be folly. It will be foolishness. It will be a very sad scenario that if we do not pass on the day of judgment. Because Allah demands very little from us. 50 prayers in Miraj. Reduced to 5. And then verse 160. From Surah An'am, Surah number 6, verse 160. What does Allah say? Man jaa bil hasana. More or less, that if you bring one good deed, the minimum reward is 10. 5 times 10? 50. We get the reward of 50 prayers. Do you know that? Whenever we pray, 
we establish five prayers in a day, we get the reward of 50 prayers. No other ummah has received such grace from Allah Almighty. So, kutiba alaykum usam. It gives us psychological comfort. The second pearl of wisdom that has been understood by the scholars from this fragment of the ayat, kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum. Nabi Akrim Muhammad was unlettered. He was not educated by any mortal, any makhluk. Indeed, he was educated by Allah Himself. He was educated by Allah Himself. I made mention in Honor Park Mosque in the story of Mi'raj that when Nabi Akrim Muhammad made it to the lot tree, to the lot tree, Sidratul. Muntaha. Now, Muntaha is an Arabic word and it means the last point. Now, there's a lot tree there that I will try to define in my own words. Nabi Akrim Muhammad says that I cannot explain the beauty. I will make mention of that in a few moments. But there's a lot tree there. And this station is known as Sidratul Muntaha, the last point. Now, the scholars say they call it the last point because when Allah gives instructions, the instructions descend and they stop at this point and when people send actions and they ascend they stop at this point that's why it is known as muntaha the last point so for orders ordinance that descends muntaha for actions that ascend muntaha and nabi akrim Muhammad says that when i made it to this lot tree it was amazing. The leaves of this lot tree were larger than the ears of an elephant. And on each leaf there was an angel making the tasbih of Allah Almighty. And the fruit that was hanging from this tree was greater than the vessels in which you cook your food. But then suddenly it was covered by noor. Now, Nabi Akrim says at that moment, at that moment when it was covered by noor, by light, I have no words to justify the beauty that was on display. And Nabi Akrim says at that time, ulum, knowledge opened upon me. Allah gave me knowledge. At that moment, Allah gave me knowledge, opened my heart, and that's why the operation took place. Because injection of thousands and thousands of different types of sciences of this world were to be injected in the heart of Nabi Akrim on the system. I'll give you a simple example. You know, you go to these dietitians. One of my students from the Malaysian group, I do a program every Sunday. She's a dietitian. Um, and uh, it's not only her. The, most of the dietitians, they say the healthy diet is 5-2. So what's this 5-2? They said, eat five days and fast two days. I said, who gave you this research? They said, a group of scientists in America. They used all the modern facilities and all the gadgets by which they could see inside the human body how it develops, what is the impact of those two days, so on and so forth. And these are a group of scientists that have only dedicated their life to this topic, one topic. They may not know anything else, only this topic of five and two. They have just studied this, nothing else. They're not engineers. They're not mathematicians. They have studied this topic and that's what they have dedicated their life to. And they are geniuses in their own department, in their own right. And after all this study, they say five, two. Eat five days in moderation and fast two days. I said, Allahu Akbar. Utitul ilm al awwaleen wal akhreen. Nabi Kareem Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was given that injection of knowledge. He came down and he said, fast every Monday and Thursday. Fast every Monday and Thursday. You can make all the researches you want to make. And you can, you know, use all the facilities and all the new gadgets. But at the end, you will only reach that which the Nabi of Allah has revealed 1400 years ago. Now, people say that uh, this is the kalam, this is the speech of Muhammad. It's not, the, it's not a divine speech. This fragment of the ayah challenges them. The fragment is that 
People in the past used to fast. Who told the Nabi of Allah? How did he know? He makes a statement and he knows that this statement will echo in the world till the day of judgment. He's so confident and there's no one to educate him. And now we pick up the encyclopedias and the different books that have preserved different cultures and ideologies. And they all agree and endorse this fragment that yes, past nations used to fast. This is a delil of the veracity, the authenticity, the truthfulness of this kalam, that this kalam is divine. And we're going to conclude on, we have time, five more minutes? And then we'll conclude. Piety, righteousness. Now, keep in mind, our goal in the month of Ramadan is what? It is to attain righteousness. Where are we going to check that righteousness? In our transactions, in our mu'amalat. Now, what is the complete true definition of taqwa so i'm going to give you the definition that was declared by ubay bin Ka'b in the presence of the third khalif in his tenure the second khalif Hazrat umar radiallahu ta'ala so Hazrat umar radiallahu ta'ala once was you know amongst the sahaba and ubay bin Ka'b was there ubay bin Ka'b is that noble person that uh, was requested, ordered by Allah Almighty to read the Quran. The very famous incident that Nabi Akrim said to Ibai bin Kaab, cutting the story short, can you recite Surah Bayyina? Because Allah has mentioned your name and has ordered me to ask you to recite Surah Bayyina. So what a great Qari. That's why he's Sayyidul Quran, the, the, the leader Qari of the Sahaba. So they say when he used to read, the foundations of the throne of Allah used to shake. Used to attract Allah Himself. So Nabi Akhirim Muhammad says to um, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala says to Ubay bin Kaab, do you know what taqwa is? He said, I can explain what taqwa is. So piety is a superficial word, it's very shallow. It is not deep rooted. So something that is encapsulated you'll say what's in this capsule he said look in this capsule there is so much and you can't really explain it for example I had gout and they said you have to take half a kilo of cherries in the morning and a half a kilo of cherries in the afternoon I said cherries one kilo I said, I can't, you know, one kilo of cherries I can't eat one kilo of cherries they said all right take one glass of cherry juice now that's only this much in two seconds I Sculpt the cherry juice. I drink the cherry juice. But if I had to eat it, it would take so long. So this is the encapsulated version of all the cherries, that cherry juice. <coughs> now, the takun is a, is a very deep root, rooted word. Yeah, the, the definition is very deep rooted. It has been encapsulated in the word taqwa. Now, Ubay bin Kabi, he opens the capsule of taqwa. And by example, he explains what is inside this capsule of taqwa. This is the best way I can, I can present it to you. So Bay bin Kaab says, look, there is an orchard. Let's, let's visualize and depict. This is an orchard. This is the entry door. This is the exit door. And there is a path in the middle. And then there is bush and thorns on both sides. There are some thorns that are overextended. And there are some that are low to the ground and there are some that have been cut now in arabia they used to wear the uniform that had excess fabric this was used to be the uh, the culture that's why my scholars say that the closest uniform to the uniform of the people of arabia is the uniform of the sudani brothers because have you seen that baggy now, why did they have excess clothes? Because they used to walk through the deserts, they used to be sandstorms, and they used to cover themselves with the excess fabric. And the very famous incident that Hazrat Abu Huraira came to the noble majlis of Nabi Akrima Basasalam and a cat fell from his sleeve. I can't even get my hand in this. How will I get a cat in this? 
So they used to wear baggy clothes. The reason was to cover themselves when needed. So just think about it, baggy clothes and a person is walking on that track, what will be the first thing that he will do? He will gather his clothes. So they do not become entangled with the thorns on the right and on the left. Especially those thorns that are overextended. And he will be very, very mindful when walking on this path and he will walk slowly and gradually and he will exit the orchard, keeping his garment intact. So Ubay bin Kaab says that that orchard is this dunya, that path is ihdina sirat al mustaqeen the right path. The garment is your uniform of faith and these thorns are temptation. So when a person, he walks, he should be very mindful, what is tempting me? What is luring me? Where are my eyes going? Where is my mind going? Because each time I falter, each time I make a mistake, I am ripping my garment of spirituality. But the only difference is that if I rip this garment, I can stitch it, but it will be visible, the stitch. But if I fall and I become entangled in temptation, but I stand up and I say, Ya Allah, forgive me, He renews the fabric. He doesn't stitch it. He doesn't stitch it. And that's why it said on the day of judgment when a person stands in front of Allah, a person who has made tawbah, even the angels forget. The angels will forget that he made a mistake. The only one that will know that he made a mistake is Allah himself. And Allah will not remind him. So that means that the fabric of spirituality that becomes entangled in temptation, in the thorns of temptation, they do rip. But if we stand up and say, Ya Allah, pardon me and forgive me. And let me tell you, don't allow anyone to tell you that Allah will not forgive you. This is the deception, the speech of the devil. Allah will forgive you. It doesn't matter what you have done. The words of the hadith, La ubali. Allah says, I don't care what you have done. You just ask me and I will forgive you. And he will renew your fabric. Take that off and give you a new one. Bright and shiny. Bright and shiny. And you exit that orchard, this dunya, by collapsing, falling, and hurting yourself, by standing up, applying the the cream uh, of uh, or the syrup of uh, tawbah renewing your fabric standing up keep walking keep walking keep walking dropping keep walking dropping standing up keep walking as long as you are on this effort you will exit the door and you will have a fabric that will protect you from the heat of the grave from the horror of the day of judgment from the heat of the sun that will be right over and above you, from the horrible circumstances that will surround you, that fabric will surround you. It will protect you, it will safeguard you, it will not desert you, it will remain with you until you make it into your destination and that is Jannah and then inshallah from that moment onwards you will be granted a fabric that uh, has no words. I have no words to describe that fabric because Prophet Muhammad Sassim has spoken about it in a subtle manner and my noble brothers should try to study the fabric that is waiting for you on that side in Jannatul Firdaus that changes 70 colors every second. 70 colors every second. And 70 fabrics together but lighter than a feather. 70 fabrics together that change 70 colors each second but lighter than a feather what is the quality of that fabric and that is the reward of the fabric that you sustain preserve the fabric of iman so always make tawbah always consider yourself to be weak don't consider yourself to be mighty do not place yourself in the arena of test. We are all weak. I am weaker than all of you. I make the most mistakes. But one thing I believe that I have, you have, and that is that we have that connection with Allah. Ya Allah, forgive me. One day, ya Allah. Forgive me. Just say that and Allah will forgive you. So let's try to establish this practice in life. 
Let's adorn ourselves with taqwa. Let's try to gather our uniform. Let's try to create an environment around us that is conducive. So when I exit this world, I have what I need. I have the chips by which I can bargain and I can enter my jannah. Inshallah, we will do that.